Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a, probably the first vlog I've done. Actually, what was the last time I did one? Uh, the last time I did a vlog was... God, I have to bear with me a sec. I mean, of course you can tell it's me, it's a good bag, great, but um... This is another kind of a vlog sort of rant video, and I haven't done these, of course, for a very long time. Um... To be honest with you, uh, these are kind of just like kind of unscheduled skits that I'm just going to do now and again. I pretty much just ramble on about rubbish and just speak my mind, I suppose. And I suppose depends on what you fancy. That if you guys like this, tell me because then I know to do it more often. But um, hang on, let me just see. Yeah, I am remember now. The last vlog I did was. 14th of May 2015, so that was a long old time ago. That was back when I was in first year halls, actually. God, look at me in that video. Bucky teeth and such, and that sort of a... Uh, that room, I miss that room now, actually. But, um... But, yeah, uh, last time I did a... a um, last time I did a vlog, it was, of course, very much a... Um, it was very much a sort of specified subject that I was talking about uh, in that I was talking about the controversies around the release of Battlef Battlefront uh, Star Wars Battlefront, or in other words Battlefront 3. Now that the game's been released, I think we can all agree it was a bit of a disappointment. I wasn't really holding my hopes up too high for it in the first place. I mean, yeah, I was willing to give it a chance, but um, yeah, I think it kind of proved us right, really. It just wasn't full of enough content or enough you know, weight and, you know, just, just content, really, is the main problem with it. It just wasn't enough of a game overall, really, to be considered a proper success, I don't think. And the fact that it was charged still at full price, I think, was disgraceful. I mean, you know, it's like barely in any semblance of a single player mode, and the fact that you can't fire iron sights just thought was ridiculous. I mean, the thing is, there are some good shooters out there, like Over like Overwatch, that where you can shoot iron, like from the hip, and it works just fine. But, um, I mean, the, you know, the Battlefront game is one that's, you know, specified and signified itself on shooting iron sights as well, uh, so I just thought the non-inclusion of that was a bit ridiculous. Although, to be fair, I actually come to think of it, Battlefront 1 kind of didn't really have a specified system for iron sight aiming, unless it was, you know, with snipers or if you're in playing in first person, so, I don't know, it depends on your viewpoint, really. But, um, yeah, I think at this point we can all agree that Battlefront 3 was a bit of a clunker. It's kind of sad, really. I mean, so many people were hope looking forward to it. But, you know, at the very least, they all, we all have the uh, seventh movie to enjoy, which, you know, was a superb film. I gave a uh, nice review of it on my blog, and um, I definitely think it was a real good winner. It was um, definitely a good sort of return back to form for the Star Wars film series. I mean, I didn't mind the prequels so much myself, but at the same time, they definitely weren't on the same level of the originals, although I never really liked episode 6 a huge amount, although the ba the battle scenes in, in it, of course, were absolutely superb, and the emotional scenes were pretty good as well, but, um, I don't know, yeah, it seems like um, the Star Wars film series is returning to form, whereas the Star Wars games are starting to stagnate a bit, which I find a bit paradoxical compared to the situation that the Star Wars franchise found itself in a few years ago, like, you know, if you, give or take a few years ago, the Star Wars uh, franchise was kind of very much the other way around. It was the films that were considered to be going down the clangor, and you know, the games were doing pretty well. You know, we had games like Star Wars Empire at War, we had Star Wars Republic Commando, we had, you know, Battlefront 2, we had, you know, um, the Star Wars Episode 3 fighting game I thought was actually pretty good. Um, then, you know, you have things like. Um, you know, you have teasers for Fallout 1313, which, you know, hopefully should be renewed again sometime soon. Uh, you know, you have Star Wars Lego, you have all these things. Um, you know, Star Wars Pod Racing, you know, all these really good games. And, um, and you know, since, you know, 2000, since 1999, rather, you know, many people considered the Star Wars games to be just really, you know, on their form. Whereas the films since that time have been considered to be claptrap, with of course you know um, exception made to the original trilogy, and um, 
it seems like at this point that kind of has been reversed to some degree because the games recently released have just been seen as kind of, you know, meh. I mean, like, Battlefront was a bit of a disappointment and, you know, um, and I can't really think of anything notable released in the last, like, four or five years of the Star Wars games. And then you, of course, have it flipped around with the new film being released, the first film released in ten years in the series that... Well, the ten years in, if you don't count, of course, that um, CGI animated film, which wasn't too bad actually. It was all right, um, but you know, and then the first, you know, the first live action film released for the franchise in ten years, and it's actually really, really good. So I just think it's a weird sort of situation that the uh, series of Star Wars finds itself in, and I think it's it's good though that the films at least are getting back on their feet because that is the basis of the franchise. That's the absolute money maker. Yeah, you know, well, I mean, while video gaming is still catching up to and in some places overtaking the film industry, um, yeah, there's still, of course, an enormous amount of money to be had in the um, uh, in the film industry. I mean, I mean, for goodness sake, the Saw franchise at one point was, you know, such an iconic horror franchise. At one point, that f franchise was earning a hundred million at the very least, a year, you know, globally, it was just like mental how much money it was earning and the fact that they were releasing one, if not two films a year at, for several years at one point, you know, it's madness. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they used some of that to create some well, yeah, subpar games, really, so to, you know, just take that as you will. But at the same time, you know, the even though the, the, even though the video game industry is overtaking the film industry in a lot of areas, the importance and profitability of the um, film industry still shouldn't be understated at all. I mean, I could talk at you know massive length for ages about the films I've seen recently. You know, I do a blog where I review pretty much every new film I see and sometimes even review a few old ones. And I can talk at length and length and length about these films stuff that I've seen and trends and sort of themes in a lot of films I see and then um, if you're looking for ammunition well I mean I can talk I can talk easily about like what are probably like my top ten favourite films of all time and I can really get engrossed in it. So you know even though the video game industry is overtaking the film industry slowly and slowly it's it's still worth talking about the uh, the film industry as a whole in that you know, like as I've said, the the Star Wars films uh, in their quality have seemed to have overtaken the Star Wars games in their quality at this point. Not overall, of course, but just simply as a blend. Attention! And Tomorrow's tactical briefing has been so, yeah, postponed. I mean, a new time and date will be forthcoming. Of that was a bit of a clanger, but excuse me, Proctor. Hey, you know what? At least we still have the film, right? Um, you have uh -huh. Speaking of films, what else have I, I found seen some recently? technical seen, documents uh, for you. Oh yeah, recently I've seen the new Deadpool film, which is amazing, and I've also seen The Revenant. Uh, I've done reviews again of those two on my blog, which I'll put in the description of this video below. Um, I prefer laser weapons myself. I'm just going to say, just go see them, really, because they're both amazing films. Deadpool is a very sort of simple film in its story. However, it conveys a lot of the emotion and the backstory through flashbacks. Although. You know, you might think, oh god, that sounds awful, but the way it does it is actually oh, very intriguing. It's, it's seen as like a bit of a fourth wall break whenever flashbacks are done, and um, how it ties into the comedy is very artistically uh, unique and very interesting, and I like the way they did it very, very much. Um, and um, the main character of Deadpool is marvellous, as always. I love Deadpool. He's, uh, you know, he's one of my favourite comic book heroes, and you know, for years and years and years at a point, for like several years at a point, like every five weeks, I would without fail snatch up like the first copy of um, uh, you know, Deadpool and Wolverine in my local off license. You know, it was just honestly, he's one of my favourite superheroes without a shadow of a doubt. And so it was nice to see him pay dividends in a proper way this time, as compared to you know X Men Origins Wolverine, which was absolute shite. Um, and. I mean, you know, people said, oh, Ryan Reynolds is playing him again, oh, God, it's going to be terrible. But honestly, it's one of his best performances he's done so far of his career. And he's, I mean, the thing is, it's not my favourite superhero film ever, but I would say that it is probably the most faithful adaptation of a uh, 
comic book slash superhero character I've ever seen. It really is. It's absolutely superb the way they portray it. Deadpool in relation to how he's shown in the comics. Absolutely superb. Um, uh, as for The Revenant, um, starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hardy, that one's surrounded by a little bit of hokey dokey as I can, as far as I can hear, because I think there were some rumours thrown around, wasn't there, that um, Tom Hardy uh, came to work on the Revenant because he was kicked off the set of, um, or he left the set rather of uh, Suicide Squad. Um, I, I mean, aside from that, that's not really important. But aside from that, the, the Revenant is also a really good film. It's not as comedic, of course. It's a film about a guy getting mauled by a bear and then having to crawl and survive like hundreds of miles in order to get his revenge on the people who have betrayed and abandoned him but um, is, that is also a superb film of course it's a lot darker hey than uh, That's close Deadpool enough, but, um, d again it's definitely worth fun. recommending I would say though trouble. that with The Revenant there are some points where okay. the visual symbolism is a little bit Not cheesy to cause any trouble. If you say I mean so, the, go the, my, the friend I went to see it with um, um, Flash Suppressor he didn't mind it too much, day, the symbolism, and um, didn't have as much of a problem with it as I did, but I don't know, I just found it a bit jarring Lyman's personally. And um, there's what also, Blake uh, I'm trying to think if there's you any other the criticisms, not, not too many really, the most of the criticisms I, mean, I can uh, level at The Revenant yeah, are quite minor, um, that. the acting is absolutely superb, you? Leonardo DiCaprio gives one of his best, if not my favourite performance of his entire career so far, and honestly the cinematography, except for a few dialogue scenes, the cinematography in The Revenant is absolutely amazing, it's some of the best cinematography honestly that I've seen since The Wrestler, it's absolutely superb Bastards. some of the camera shots and stabbing shots well, you know a bit gratuitous in their length are just beautifully now done absolutely superb the and the action scenes that filmed are filmed in such a human old. sort of and visceral way that you can really get drawn in it's yeah no it's an amazing film honestly go see both of them if you can still if they're still showing in your area i mean they might not be they might be going to dvd at some point soon because they're um I don't have much to watch. Yeah, showings at cinemas but might end sometime soon. Mary, they took her locket too. But it's um yeah, I'd definitely give those a recommendation. If you could get it back, As for TV, of course, is if you've been checking out my um vlogs, I've recently finished watching The Legend of Korra. I watched The Legend of A the Avatar The Last Endbender ages ago don't when worry. I was little and never I'll really fully finished it. Then me. I finished Good. it for the first f Connie again properly like recently. Of course, it was amazing. I started The Legend of Korra for the first time recently. I finished that after a few days um, on Amazon Prime Video, and it is superb. It's probably one of my best, if not my favourite, cartoons of all time. Um, I mean, I would say objectively it is, it is about the same level as um, uh, Avatar The Last Ember, but me personally, I kind of prefer it a little bit more just because it's a bit more of a mature... Um, uh, series and a bit more realistic in terms of its human relations. I mean, again, if you want to see my like proper opinions on it, you can check out um, vlogs um, or sorry, podcasts that I've done with Flash Suppressor. Um, the at least the first two that I've done so far, and um, you'll get a bit of a proper idea because it's you know it's not just me nambling on about it. It's you know two people who have quite you know considerably uh, somewhat different you know opinions about the two series. Uh, talking against each other, so it's you know it's a bit more of a balanced uh, assessment of the Legend of Korra. And then what's also what else has been happening with me recently? Oh God, yeah. Um, well, I mean, some of you might know I'm a um, in the world of uh, sports. I am a Charlton Athletic supporter. Uh, Charlton Athletic, as some of you who may not know, are is a um, a uh, second division football team in England who have recently have just been on an absolute garbage run of matches. We've lost, I think it's now, it's like four or five in a row. Um, we've still got about a third of the season left, but at the same time, you know, from, uh, I think the last time we won was sometime in like mid where we beat them 4-1 um, but even still it's like I think it's like 4 or 5 games now we've come without a defeat and like the last three games at least uh, got, no, that we've gone without um, at least getting a point I mean sorry and 
I mean, the last three defeats have just been heartbreaking. Like, you know, we had one on Saturday last week, which was um, three 0 to Fulham, and then you now you have. Hey, personal. Oh, actually, I think Friday last week, it was 3 0 to Fulham. Then we faced Preston North End on Tuesday, just gone by. Uh, um, they beat us 2 1. And then what was really heartbreaking is we faced. Um, who was it? Reading on Saturday, just gone by. And we managed to claw back from 3 1 down to get to 3 3. Just be And then just before the end of the match, like literally in like, the last minute of the match, Reading got like one of the most luckiest rebound sort of goals you can imagine and they ended up winning 4-3 so it's like Charlton have been on a pretty dismal run at the moment. Um, I mean some people say to me, oh, you know, get back, you could, you know, support someone else, someone who's a bit bigger and, you know, technically a bit more reliable because of course Charlton haven't been very good since, uh, since at least, you know, 2005 or so. Um, but, you know, it's like... Ultimately, Charlton are my family team, and they're also technically my local team as well. I mean, um, I was born in central so London. I was born in um, Guy's here. Hospital in central London, but um, near yeah, London Bridge. But I, um, but the first place I lived in actually after I was born was actually Charlton. It was actually Charlton, Shoot up. Shoot up. Charlton ah. Um, and then I've also, you know, lived in multiple across South East London, such as, you know, Lee Green, uh, Woolwich, um, yeah, um, Central Greenwich, North Greenwich, um, I mean, I've lived in a couple of other places over the course of my life. I've lived for a year at one point in Harringay, right next to Tottenham in North London, and I even lived for a couple of years over the course of my life, uh, particularly in my younger years, in, um, in Brussels, in Belgium, believe it or not, um, so, but, you know, for the most part of my younger years, I was living in South East London, and particularly in areas where Charlton were the more local team. Um, so, you know, it, and the fact that, you know, back to at the very least my, my granddad or my dad's side of the family, that there has been Charlton supporters in my family, I think it's more than uh, reasonable that I um, support Charlton Athletic, even though we have been pretty pants for the last few years. Um, I mean, things, I've got like a selection of, you know, so many teams I could support. I mean, like, nice. you know, at one point I lived near, at one point I lived near several, you know, really good high tier Belgian teams. At one point, you know, I've lived near Brighton and Hove Alba, you know, all teams that are considered to do better than Charlton at the moment. and. I could I support any of those. You know, I also show a little bit of affinity for Leicester City and Southampton, but you know, while I sort of, while I do really like those teams, um, ultimately I feel like I have to support Charlton because they're my family team. I can't really turn my back on them, especially when they were my local team just after I was born. The fact that they were still my local team growing up through out many of my younger years, and while I didn't get into football until say a couple of years ago. Uh, like, I mean, I always considered myself a bit of a chance sponsor, to be honest. Um, you know, it's really much more of a habitual sort of, um, you know, inheritable sort of thing at first with me. But I did get into football really quite passionately, like, if over the last two, two and a half years. Um, so I thought it was, you know, logical, immediate first port call to start supporting Charlton Athletic, even though, you know, there's, you know... Even though, you know, at the time I was living in North London right next to Tottenham, you know, it's like I could just easily support them Tottenham and, um, you know, they're a much better team than Jordan, that's for sure. And even where I'm living now, Brighton, Brighton and Hove Albion at this point in time are still in the championship in the same division as Charlton, but they're much better than Charlton at the moment. They're like, I think it's something like sixth or seventh in the championship. And, you know, they're still chasing promotion. And they're an amazing team. They've got so many good players, loads of like former internationals, and Charlton have got like a few international players, but we just really haven't been capitalising on any positives we've got. We, you know, we've got one of the most positive, you know, fan bases, you know, in the country, but at the same time, it's just like we're just not utilising it enough. You know, we've got really rubbish owners who just don't care about the club enough to really put their all into it, and. 
so low we've just got so many crap defenders as well it's just really not looking up to uh, the heavens for Charlton at the moment so I'm not putting my hopes up too much at the, mo at the very least I'm going to hope Charlton stay up in the championship in something like say I don't know 20th or 19th maybe but even then, you know, we'd have to work really hard for the rest of the season at this point to achieve I've that. Got that lock at and that speaking of football, actually, That's great the, uh, the title race for the Premier League seems to be whole, racing up a little Whatever bit, I think. Be, you know, you you've got, um, got you know, you've got Man City almost bowing out at this point. I mean, they could sort of maybe get back into it at this point, but at the same time, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit of a uh, crapshoot for them at this point. Um... Leicester, I think, are probably the most likely ones to win it at this point because you know they've got a lot of heart, they've got a lot of good international players, and they've got a really great manager and a really good team spirit. And while they're not so great defensively at the back, sometimes they've still got you know some proper good defenders like Robert Hooth and their attackers like you know Riyad Mahrez and Jamie Vardy with their pace and all that. Larky just more than make up for you know most of the misgivings that they had. Um, Arsenal, I still think, are kind of in it in uh, even after their defeat at the hands of Manchester City. I mean, sorry, not Manchester City, what am I talking about? No, Manchester United, For please forgive me. Um, That's just garbage. You know, I, say, I still think even after being rocked, they still have a chance of it. They're going to have to work really hard after that. Uh, so, you know, really capitalise on it, especially after defeating you know, Leicester City a couple of weeks before Oscar. that. Um, Spurs, I think, are probably the second most likely team to win in the, uh, the league this season. And I find it particularly interesting because I don't think until like a few weeks ago people really considered Spurs a full-on challenger. You know, they considered Spurs having a solid chance to, you know, have, make a challenge for the title, but not be so, you know, assured in the chance of uh, getting into a solid position of gaining it as to say Leicester or Man City or Arsenal. However, I think Spurs have been, you know, quite patient and quiet about their attempts to get into a position to have a grab at the uh, Premier League title and if they win it, it will be interesting, it will be very interesting and uh, no, considering that I have friends back home in London who support Tottenham Hotspurs and I have a father who used to play for a youth team back in the 80s, it's just that uh, it would be interesting, it definitely would be interesting, um, I think it would be interesting if any of like Spurs, Arsenal or Leicester won it really because you know, Arsenal haven't won it for years, Tottenham like a, you know, you know, they're a proper like, working man's team, and uh, you know, I've got like a sort of, uh, I've got a lot of, lot of people I care about who support them and who, you know, have been affiliated with them in the past. And then Leicester, you know, they're the sort of home ground of like one of my favourite players of all time, Gary Lineker, and they're just such a spirited club at the moment. They just about managed to avoid relegation at the end of last season, and now they're in a solid position to win their first division title for God knows how long. Um, and the fact that we, you know, you know, they weren't really considered top contenders at the beginning of the season. They've just come up from such a shitty position to be, uh, you know, division leaders with, you know, a two-point lead over their second, uh, over their second placeholders. And the fact that, you know, they're riding high with players who technically aren't considered as high quality as other players playing for the, uh, you know, the other, the rest of the top six. I mean, you know, think about some of the players that the rest of the top six have got in the moment. You know, people like Ozil and um, Giroud for Arsenal, and you know, Ericsson, Kane, and uh, Ali for uh, Spurs. You know, Rooney, uh, Martial, De Gea, you know that lot for uh, Man U. Um, you know, company, um, Silva, De Bruyne, Aguero, Hart. You know. Um, like um, Otamendi, you know, all that lot for City, you know, all these really top quality players. I mean, Leicester have just got these, you know, players mixed from like old clubs who, you know, have sold off their players and, and a bunch of like youth academy trained players, and they've just made so much out of it. It's superb to see what they've done with so little, and they've really, really made big names for themselves. And you see all these players who aren't considered as high quality as other, you know players of the same position in the Premier League but they're just really making the most of it they're really coming into their own the youth academy players they've got are really coming into their own and the players that they've brought from other teams like say you know Watford and 
Lucknow and Stoke and all that lot are really coming into their own as well. So I think, you know, Leicester could easily win it. I think they're definitely the most likely at this point to win it, considering the fact that they've been at the number one position of the Premier League for so long now. You know, I think it's more than likely they're going to win it. Um, so what was... Um, I suppose. I suppose I should, we should um, point out where I um, where I plan to take this channel actually because I've been thinking about it a lot recently. I've, I've, you know, I've been uploading a lot more recently. I've been putting a lot more effort into this YouTube channel, even despite working at uni a lot at the moment. And I thought. Um, I don't want to sort of do an episode every single day because um, that would wear you guys out a bit. So I'm going to kind of do it like a working week. I'm going to upload a video every sort of weekday. And what I'll do is I'll probably do something like, say, um, every, let's say, every, every Monday, we'll do like one of these sort of like personal vlogs or rants or, or whatever. Um, um, then, you know, on like Tuesday we'll do like a let's play, an episode of a let's play, Wednesday we'll do World Tanks, Thursday we'll do another uh, let's play, and then Fridays we'll do either a podcast or, an, or a rant, and then if we don't do a rant or a vlog actually on Mondays, then we'll just do another episode of the uh, let's play, but um, and then, but then what I'm going to do is on uh, Saturdays and Sundays, so on weekends I'll be uploading a blog on both sun Saturday and Sunday for my uh, written blog so you guys I'll ch again I'll put that in the description but you guys might like to check it out I do like video game and film reviews and recipes and restaurant reviews and all that like you just mixed, but mixed bag really on my, kind of like this channel um, so I think that's why how I'm going to do it uh, so you know I don't stress myself out too much with making too many videos I keep it to you know the weekday and I have an ordered structure or, or at least you know a 50% semi-ordered structure of doing things and uh, you know you guys can at least expect a somewhat semi-regular sort of way of me uploading and um, you know you can at least sort of think all right so it's a weekend you get bad you'll be busy you know writing down some uh, blogs and uh, blog uh, post and um, yeah, I hope you know. I hope you guys can enjoy that sort of schedule. It's it's just a bit easier for me, really, and I hope it you know won't wear you guys out too much. Because I thought if I do an episode on this channel every single day, it might burn you guys out a bit. You might get a bit exhausted and tired. And, you know, I don't want to be like a fucking like one of those reaction channels who like upload like fucking five videos every day. You know, where they basically steal content from you know hardworking YouTubers. Um, Actually, that's something as well. Like, fucking hell. Um, you know, I mean, there's been a lot of controversy around those sort of reactionists for a long time now, since at least early 2015. Um, at least, probably, you know, probably a bit earlier than that, comes to think of it. Um, I think when I probably got made aware of it was when I Hate Everything did his uh, video about reactionists um, and how much he sort of disagreed with their model of um, operation, shall we say, on them. On YouTube, and um, I did very much agree with him for the most part. Um, actually, no, probably pretty, pretty much entirely. To be honest, I pretty much agreed with him entirely. Come to think of it, um, and um, I'd have to say, um, yeah, I'd have to say probably the, the most craziest thing about this, though is. You know, it's not just the fact that a lot of these reactions are just kind of scumbagging the way that they're, you know, stealing content and not really properly giving the people who they're reacting to proper credit. Um, but it's the fact that really big YouTubers have, like, reacted quite sort of, you know, anti, shall we say, to them. I mean, you know, you have people like um, Jack's Films, you know, it's got like, how many subscribers has he got at this point? Like, three or four million at least. And then you've got PewDiePie, he's got like fucking 45 million subs, he's the most subscribed YouTuber of all time. Um, you know, he's just the most subscribed YouTuber on YouTube at the moment, and he's got like 45 million, 46 million even subscribers. Even he uh, sort of disagrees with what his reactions to doing. You know, I think, um, I think Markiplier does as well, I'm pretty sure. Um, and he's just crazy, and 
how these people are just sort of like, you know, making so much money off of videos they're not even authorised to react to. Then, for the most part, I'm pretty sure most of them haven't even asked the original creators if, you know, for their permission. If you say, oh, hey, can I react to your, you, can I rea make a reaction video to this video you made? Most of the time, I'm pretty sure they haven't even asked that, you know. In fact, some of them asked, it's some, what really pissed me off about that, actually, is the fact that some of them, you know, uh, go and say, like, oh, um, we want, um, you know, we want you to come up to us and ask us first if, you know, you want us to not react to these things. And it's like, no, 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 listen, like, the best way to do it is to ask the person who's made the thing uh, if you can react to it. Now, ask them first. Take the initiative for yourself. Don't be so lazy. Don't be so disrespectful. It's their content that you're reacting to. You should be asking them, not them prefacing you in any way. They, you should be the ones asking them. Absolutely, 100%. Um, and even then, you know, usually these people are just like playing these videos in their entirety. And you know, say what you will about that, that kind of sort of content making, but at the same time, if you are going to make, if you are going to play a fi fi video in its entirety, you have to at least edit it, say something, you know, uh, in and constructive and um, influential and um, differentiating about it and you know actually edit it and even then I probably wouldn't recommend playing the film in its entirety f without any edits um, you know I'd say you know you have to say something transformative about it you have to edit it and you have to you know you know preface it and conclude it a bit you know if you don't do that it's just simply not fair use it's, and so many of these Reactionists just ignore that, and they get paid so much money. I think to myself, you know, I mean, okay, my reaction, my um, my upload schedule has never been consistent, really, over the years. I'm trying to make it more consistent now, but at the same time, I think like, you know, to myself and like so many other YouTubers out there who are struggling to even get a thousand subscribers, and or even a hundred in some cases. And then you have people like these reactionists who are getting like fucking 100,000 subscribers, half a million, uh, 750,000, two and a half million, crazy numbers, and they just fucking put no effort into it. And again, this, and to be fair, this isn't like attacking them personally, you know, for all I know in real life, in, you know, in person, in private, they could be lovely people, and I'm sure most of them probably are, to be honest, but... At the same time, the, just the way they're going about their YouTube business just isn't right. It's not, it's not con in concise with um, YouTube's fair use and copyright system, uh, or, got, or co for YouTube's fair use and copyright guidelines, and it's it's just it's weirdly scummy as well. Just not asking these people at first for their permission to react to the videos and the content that they've made, and the fact that even big YouTubers like you know, Jacks. Jack's films and uh, PewDiePie and like saying no, I don't agree with these kind of people. I don't think that they should be doing this. They should ask me if they want to react to my stuff first. I agree with that. I think I feel for you know big YouTubers like that and small YouTubers alike that you know are just having their videos reacted to without their permission, and by these people who don't say anything informative or transformative at all about them. And just sit there for like the entirety of the video, barely say anything before or after, or even during, and just watch it in its entirety, just doing nothing. And it's just like, usually they'll just sit there with a creepy pedo smile and just fucking like, sort of just holding their chin, sort of trying to look, you know, soft and thoughtful and just start, okay, you can put a bit more effort into it. I mean, like, okay, sure, maybe my films aren't the best, maybe my videos aren't the best produced in the world, of course, but. At least I try, at least I do I try and put a bit of effort into it and you know try and variate it a bit sometimes. It's just like you just look at these people, these reactionists, and they just do so at all to, you know, transformatively, you know, alter the videos that they're reacting to. You know, I see some people who say, you know, don't say too much during their reactions to certain videos that you watch. They you know they might at least, you know, cut out the large bits where they're just doing nothing and they're not really reacting at all and they're not saying anything. And even then, they usually you know say something before or after it, and even then, like a lot of the time, they say something during. And then, of course, you know the reaction and, uh, channels who you know cut up the videos, don't play them in their entirety, say a lot of stuff that's transformative and instructive throughout the video, 
uh, you know, all this sort of stuff that really, you know, allows it to be fair use. And I see so many people doing this, like, you know, h 3 h Productions, Chad Tronic, you know, I hate everything. Uh, you know, Your Movie Sucks, and um, all these other channels um, who've made a name for themselves reacting to things, but, you know, in a legitimate and fair use kind of way. And I just see them being screwed out of, you know, revenue so many times when they get copyright strikes and, you know, they, they you know, unjustly sort of um, penalised by the YouTube copyright system. And yet people like these, you know, big, like these up-and-coming reactionists who do fuck all to sort of transfer into the assess the videos they're watching, they get penalised even though they genuinely are breaking copyright rules and regulations. And um, it just sickens me as well because... You know, they're just not getting penalised for doing something that is clearly wrong. And yet people like the stage critic, I hate everything, your movie sucks, uh no, Chantronic, H E H three productions. All these talented people who, you know, are trying their best, uh, you know, doing what they do, doing what they love, and they're just getting penalised for you know, fucking stupid reasons. I mean and that's another point I suppose I should touch on is the fact that the copyright system on YouTube is absolutely shattered at the moment. It's just rubbish. It's so shit. I mean, people as far wide as, you know, you know, Chuck to um, Afro Mega Sin, from H3, H3 Productions to I Hate Everything, from, you know, um, uh, from the Nostalgia Critic to. Hell, even fucking Watch Mojo can think of it actually. You know, does anyone actually remember that? Back, you know, back when they had like four and a half out, uh, million subscribers, I think it was, in December 2013, back when all this, uh, you know, copyright strike shit, like, started up, Watch Mojo got taken down for like 21 hours. You know, at that point they were the 16th most subscribed to the channel on YouTube, I think they had something like 4.5 to 4.6 million subscribers. Even compared to now, when they have over 10 million subscribers, that's still an enormous amount of subs. And you think, like, even a channel as big as that can still be, you know, hit with one of these strikes and still be taken down without any explanation, you know, without any legitimacy. It's just disgraceful. And the fact that it happens to so many smaller channels, like I Hate Everything, you know, the, you know, the Nostalgia Critic, you know, people like that. And, they, and then people who are even smaller than them. It's just disgraceful. It really is. And the fact that uh, people are able to put on copyright claims and steal someone's revenue for like say somewhere between you know 10 days to like possibly even a few months and just the person who gets claimed against doesn't any get any compensation even though usually these claims are illegitimate and there's no compensation for them at all and when it's proved to be false you know the person who's making the claim doesn't get any reprimandation you know it's just insane it really is and it just kind of pisses me off oh, it's right back to you know when i had 11 subscribers I got a copyright claim on, uh, I think it was episode one of my um, Fallout 4 playthrough, and it was completely illegitimate. It was by this company who claimed to represent this other company that I'm pretty sure they didn't represent about over this 31 second portion of the song Easy Living by Billie Holiday, which was released in 1937, and it's part of the soundtrack of the film of the same name, Easy Living. A uh, very good classic film, actually, definitely recommend watching it. Um, the song itself is also a very good song, um, and it turned out that the representative that the claim was claiming to represent had ownership of the song, but in actual fact they didn't. They had ownership over a tribute song to Billie Holiday, which was made sometime I think in the 60s after she was um, And I basically had to research this uh, because I, I counterclaimed this claim, of course, the couple of checks, and I made a, uh, an appeal. And in this appeal, I included several links to Wikipedia articles and other accounts of, you know, information that proved, or that showed at least, that you know, the information that the um, claimant was making was false. The, the their claim was incorrect, and it, you know, I, was, I didn't try to be too aggressive. I said like. No, I don't have any reason to believe that this claim is legitimate, as I cannot see too many reasonable uh, some, uh, you know, conclusions from this evidence and these links that the claimant or their representee has ownership over the content of the video. Um, unfortunately, you know, I got the, uh, got the claim removed and it should get um, I mean, YouTube's 
in the, in the, the way you earn money on YouTube is based through, you know, ad revenue and uh, traffic. And I mean, I don't get traffic per month to get any money, really. I mean, I have, I think I've um, built up like three cents or something at this point over like the last couple of years. But um, I don't get enough traffic per month at all, really, to you know, earn any money. I think you have to get some at least um, views a month before you start getting paid with any threshold of money. And I think even then, basic threshold isn't a huge amount of sun, something like that. Not a huge amount, but at the same time, it's like, no, it's not. Um, you know, fortunately enough for me, I mean, it was a piss take. I thought, you know, I want to, you know, get the monetization back on this video, but at the same time, it wasn't too big of an issue for me because I thought, well, I don't get enough traffic on this video or any of my videos at this point. Um, but I thought to myself, you know, with the ease at which it was done against me, in fact, I didn't even get an alert on my YouTube uh, messaging system or all my email accounts into my YouTube account. And the fact that it's happening to so many other people with even less, you know, notification and even less sort of uh, uh, compensation. I mean, the good thing about my case is I, mean, I don't get enough traffic to get paid at that point. I still, do, still don't as of this video. Um, and, yeah, I was able to get the claim removed reasonably quickly. Um, I mean, I would have rather had it removed immediately, but, you know, you know I hear about these tales of, like, picking on YouTube and having to take, like, three or four weeks to get those removed. Um, YouTubes that do actually get paid on the basis of their revenue because they get a lot of traffic. Um, but, uh, yeah, exactly. I just think that seems four weeks and like you know it's just crazy it's just crazy how much fast. shit you had to go through with that like you had to make two long long, 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 long uh, you know professional assessment of why the YouTube copyright system was wrong including a you know very very apt uh, hashtag where's the fair use uh, you know but um, yeah, multiple sort of uh, YouTubers are using like I hate everything, your movie sucks, Alpha and Mega Sin, you know, all these you know, quite very big YouTubes in fact. Um, and I think it's very apt. Uh, I think it's you know, it's more than apt to a lot of big name YouTubers. First of all, it's like the right thing they should be doing this because But it's, you know, it's because of the you know, the amount of traffic and Ad revenue they get on their videos is equaled, is you know equated into the amount of money they earn per month from their YouTube uh, channel. You know if that's brought down for like you know three weeks on even just one of their videos, that's going to damage their re ad revenue and their income a lot. In some cases, this you know happens to some channels for like months at a time. And you know, sometimes they get like a temporary strike where they can you know, only upload like 15 minute videos, and you know, that's happened to several channels recently. It's happened to people like Sarkin and you know, Nostalgia Critic again, you know, who got like you know, copyright strikes or, or like severe copyright claims for like the stupidest of reasons and ends up not being able to get you know, ad revenue videos for like several weeks. Videos for weeks and weeks and weeks on end. It's just ridiculous. Really, 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 really ridiculous. And like I said, it doesn't affect me as badly at this point as some of those guys. But at the same time, I technically have, you know, a lot less protection against this. Like, just travesty. Uh, because I'm a much smaller channel. I only have like 14 or so subscribers in this video. And it's not very much to protect myself with. I mean, I mean, I appreciate every single subscriber I get. Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. But, I think you can all admit I'm not that very big at the moment on YouTube, and as a result, I don't really have that much protection uh, against this sort of copyright claim and strike sort of skull fuckery. And the fact that, you know, big YouTubers like Your Movie Sucks, uh, Sargon of the Cat, uh, nostalgia critic. Um, I hate everything. You know, all these big channels they have so much trouble, you know, combating uh, these copyright claims and strikes. The fact that they have to deal with them every other day is 
as often as that. It's just ridiculous. It's quite clear to me at this point, and I hope everyone, for that matter, the you know the YouTube copyright system needs some serious work. And I mean, in all honesty, while it might seem as a bit of an extreme, I'm totally with Grade A under A on the um, idea that people should be messaging and emailing the uh, head exec of um, YouTube, telling her that, you know, come on, these are the cases that have happened to us. This needs serious change. And I mean, I've heard some people say, like, um, like scarce, that um, not much has happened. And we shouldn't really hope for too much to happen as of yet. But you know, it is encouraging, of course, that they have declined to take steps to Again, not much has happened so far. I doubt much will really happen for a long while, but if we make enough fuss with enough of us in the YouTube community towards the executive and everyone else in charge for that matter, you know. I think, you know, results will start to pay dividends at some point soon enough if we continuously make a big enough of a fuss. Um, because otherwise, you know, people, innocent sort of content creators and small scale channels are just going to continuously be abused and they have their ad revenue taken away. In some cases, have their accounts just completely removed. I mean, some have had their accounts removed since 2013 and still haven't got them back. You know, it's just absolutely insane. So, this scene needs serious change. Um, yeah, no, shut up. Uh, needs serious change pronto. Um, Mm. But yeah, that's my two cents on the whole YouTube copyright system. But I mean, it's just broken. It's it's really, really needs some serious change. But um, but yeah, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna end it there because I'm getting a bit late. You know, it's quite late on a Sunday night. And, um, I haven't got any lectures tomorrow because the lecture for tomorrow was cancelled. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I hope you guys enjoyed this little rant. I'm gonna maybe, I'm, I'm gonna just try and limit these to, you know, when I've got a lot on my mind and stuff like this, you know, like I did in this episode. Whereas the podcasts are like gonna have like a more structured system. But anyway, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Uh, as always, you're gonna have fun with whatever you're playing, stuff to say. Uh, enjoy whatever you're doing, as long as it's legal. As long as it's legal, I mean. And, uh, you know, it's been the boy, get back the great. And of course, until next time, I'll see you guys on the battlefield and uh, stay tuned. Ziele fast! Wirkungstreffer! Ich seh sie nicht mehr!